We came to conquer. We're here. We made it. You're still making. It's a lot to, to be done. Now, this story is one that I've wanted to share for a while. It's the story of anybody who leaves their home country and jumps into the unknown. You leave everybody that you love behind. You leave everything that you've ever known. You get on the plane without knowing what's gonna wait for you on the other side. And so you hope and you get smart and you survive. This is my immigrant story. Olha que eu tenho. Uma câmera que nem a sua, É mesmo. In 1998, there were approximately 26.3 million immigrants who came to the United States. Of those millions, I was one of them. I was born into a working class family in Rio de Janeiro. We had everything we needed to succeed by Brazilian standards. But for my mom, that wasn't enough. She wanted more for her three kids and she wanted the peace of mind to know that they weren't gonna get robbed at gunpoint on a school bus. And despite inviting my dad to come and take the journey with us, he stayed in fear of losing too much. So we parted ways and said our goodbyes at the airport. You never really understand the meaning of the word terminal until you're ripped away from your family members at a gate. Now, I should have grown up with my grandma, but I have to admit that these moments are very few. And so whenever I have them, I bring a camera to document and relive. Maybe one day I can rewatch them enough to fill in 25 years of missed memories. And that's just one small price you pay to get the American dream. All right, let me back it up for a second. I gotta explain what happened in those 25 years. So here's how it went down. One day we were out getting pizza and my mom told me, my brother and sister, that we were gonna be moving to America. I looked up at her and I didn't even know America was a thing because I didn't even understand the concept of a country, let alone that I lived in one and let alone that there were others. She told us that we'd be learning a new language, that they wouldn't look like us, but that if we were together, anything was possible. Next thing you know, I'm getting ready for the big day. I picked out my favorite red shirt and my grandma needed me a special blue hat so I would have something homemade for the trip. We'd be going in two shifts, me, my sister, my grandparents. And a few weeks later, my mom would show up with my brother. My dad would stay and we didn't know when we'd see him again. The excuse was Disney. We're going to Disney. That's what we were told to say. Except by technicalities, we never left Disney because we never left the States again, at least not for 12 years. We showed up in this cold place called Connecticut. I remember I had the hardest time pronouncing it. The first thing we did was get out of the plane. I shivered and we went straight to Walmart to pick up my first sweatsuit. It made me look like a purple grape and I loved it. Why did I choose Connecticut? Uh -huh. <sighs> because of my brother. And three months later, he decided to move to Florida. And you guys are going to school, you are getting used to the English, to the language, habits. And I decided just to keep, keep you here and do the best as I could. The violence was so bad then and it's still going on now. And we live in Rio, uh, it's pretty much like living in New York. And I like the countryside and I, shouldn't, I, I couldn't pick up any better place to raise you guys. What was the hardest part when you first moved? <sighs> that was like when I need to decide. Uh, I wasn't making too much money and I need to decide. Either I would pay the rent, I would feed you guys, or I would start buying clothes for you for the winter time. Because in Brazil we don't have the snow and our winter clothes not even close to what we need in here. I kept working and made enough money, paid the rent, and God knows why it is, you know, it is what it is. We fight and if you build, they will come, right? <laughs> Pretty much. I never really liked school. Maybe it's because I was obviously so damn different. <laughs> I was only friends with the kids who had something different about them, whether it was curly hair, brown skin, a different last name. I knew that they would understand some of my struggles. 
And every once in a while, I'd get a little straggler who was just curious about the foreign girl. I get asked if I swam here, if I lived in a teepee, and if my family was in the Amazon right now. And I shrugged it off. From a young age, I knew that I knew things they didn't. And I had to keep it to myself because me trying to explain it wouldn't do anything justice. When you got here, were you scared? <laughs> yeah, but everybody thinks I'm very courageous. Uh, I never fear anything. And like I always tell you guys, you know, fear is the art to be afraid and not let anybody realize how afraid you are. And just keep fighting. Keep fighting for your dreams. Never give up. And I had to keep pushing, even on my least favorite day of the year, picture day. It'd be the days that the photographers would come with these tiny, stupid combs and they would stick it in my hair. And it was the days that I felt the most different. It was then that I realized that I had to look out for myself because a lot of people didn't understand me or how to take care of me. We were all in survival mode. My mom was working, cleaning houses, and raising other kids as a nanny. And we were left to fend for ourselves. I learned English the fastest. Maybe it's because I had the least amount of Portuguese in my brain. I was only five. But as we grew up and our English got better, we became our own parents. Because if your mom doesn't know what a permission slip says, how is she going to sign it? The power of language gave me keys to access this adult world that most kids would never even get to experience. I was taken out of class from a young age because when I learned how to speak English and Portuguese, I became the converter that would allow the new students to ask how to go to the bathroom so they wouldn't have to pee themselves like I had. It felt pretty damn good. And then I dedicated my life to learning languages because of it. There was always this feeling like I didn't belong anywhere. I would call my family in Brazil. My dad would look at me like I was growing into somebody that he didn't know. And it was true, he didn't know me anymore. And through my thick accent, we were able to have the basic conversation that kept our relationship afloat for 12 years before I saw him again. The first Christmas, you remember that? I, I always told you, no matter whatever we have, that's what we're gonna share. And I used to give all of you $10 each. And I would take you to the dollar store and each of you should get something for each of us thinking what could make us happy just with one dollar. That was not because of the money. I just want you to learn how to care. You never forgot that. And you know how to share, you know, and you know how to make a difference. You don't need too much to be happy, you know. And you taught me something very important when, when I was in a very bad moment, and you know that. The moment you told me, whatever I have, if it cannot fit on my backpack, I don't need it. And I need to learn that. Because I always thought that because you <laughs> you guys gave up in so much when you came over, that was my duty to provide, to give you everything I could and I could not. And um, how many times you guys made fun of me because we had a lot of chairs in the backyard and tables because to me it was always important to have people around, friends around. And um, I always wanted to have the feeling that if anybody come to our house, they will have a spa. They will have a place to see and enjoy life, enjoy friends. And that's how we did. There was nothing malicious about it. We were all just doing what we had to do. And it's not till now that I sit back and digest and think, damn, that shit was hard. A lot of people don't talk about the sacrifice that comes with being an immigrant. Not only are we ridiculed in our new country, but a lot of the sadness comes from leaving everything behind. The big what if will forever be in our minds. What if I had been raised in Brazil? What if I would have grown up there? And sometimes my grandparents resent it. They wish they could have been around their grandkids as they grew up. Just now, later in life, have I started rebuilding relationships with my cousins that I should have been raised around. And I'm glad that I'm at least having this chance now because shit, these people are incredible. In the States, you're raised as an individual. Everything is very individual. And from where I come from, we're all about family. And I don't think that goes away if you just get on a plane. It's still inside of me. It wasn't until 2010 that my mom married an American for love that we were able to get our green cards. And I remember thinking, wow, I finally get to go back to Brazil, but I don't feel Brazilian at all. But I also didn't feel American at all. 
And that was when I realized that I would always be Brazilian when I was in the States and I would be American when I was in Brazil. And I didn't identify 100% with either one of those because I wasn't either one of those. I was somewhere in between. And I coined the term in-betweener. And that's still where I stand. So I went back to Brazil when I was 17 and I was full of angst. I was angry. I was mad. I was mad that my dad didn't come and visit. I was angry that we had spent so much time away. I was mad that they made fun of my accent. I was just pissed off. And that pissed off behavior was just concealing pain of relationships that I was born to have and just simply couldn't have. And I couldn't be mad at it because I had a great life in the States. In fact, now I can say that I have one of the best lives. I fly all over the world and I meet all these different kinds of people and I get to inspire the masses. I live the best life in so many ways. I'm the luckiest person in the world and I know that. But that immigrant pain, I think that's what's fueling all of it. Because I want to make all of the sacrifice worthwhile. It had to be for something. And I won't stop working until it is. Do you regret anything? Never. Never. I was not made to be comfortable. I need to fight. I need to go get it. I did everything the way I want to do. And even with all the mistakes, you know, um, I did the right thing, the right moment in my life. And I couldn't be proud of all of you guys because you know how hard it was for me to fight and I see a fire in all of you. I couldn't ask for any other lives so on my life. And I'm so proud that you picked me to be your mom. If I just can see you guys happy and safe, we did it. We totally did it. <laughs> and everything fell in place, you know. Got put the right people on your path and uh, that's what happened. I had people helping me. <laughs> Boy, you're ruining the video. You are ruining the video. Oh my god, I'm gonna kill him. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> yes, we're here. We, our house was a club. Boy, you want to keep ruining the video? <laughs> Literally. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> He's part of it now. <laughs> oh my god. Take a moment. <laughs>